Hi, hi everybody. Uh, welcome back again here. I was actually seeing this is the tenth session that we have had with the archival project uh, and the archival project. And uh, yeah, wow, we have uh, actually been through ten sessions. This is the tenth one, so that's uh, that's a landmark. And uh, so today we have uh, Samira Bose and Nupudesai from Asia Art Archives, and uh, they're gonna interact with the practitioners. They're gonna help us uh, sort of see ways of how we can interact with archives. And uh, in the group, we have uh, uh, Aku from Manipur, Labdiang, Rituparna, uh, Pranami, and Chingami. And we have Kumam as the curator of the project. Uh, I'm so sorry, actually, I'm getting a call from uh, Chingami. So maybe I can just pass over to you and then... Uh... Okay, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <coughs> Okay, I'm just going to share my screen to begin. Okay. You're able to see this presentation? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So hello, everyone. And thank you so much to Northeast Lightbox for this invitation to sort of engage with you all. And we're really excited to share some of our work with Art and Archives with you today. And also to hear from you sort of about your practices and your ideas of working with archives as part of this residency and also maybe otherwise. Um, as an organization, we're deeply interested in how our artists are intervening in and participating in archives and therefore public memory and how they sort of mediate our access to uh, or relationship to archives and how artists are also makers and builders of archives. So as part of the session, Nupur and I will be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then we'd really like to open it up to you all. Um, we can definitely take any questions that you might have uh, about our work or our presentation, but we were also sort of hoping to use that time to brainstorm uh, with you all and hear some of your ideas for uh, entering the archives that you'll be working uh, with for this residency. And if there's any way that we can help or share any references that may be of interest to you. Um, so to begin, this term archive is something that we are hearing often in our everyday vocabularies. And it, in a sense, has so many meanings and contexts in which it is referenced that it's difficult to kind of pinpoint exactly what it is. And I don't say this as an issue, but as something to sort of take note of, and in particular to find ways to specify for ourselves what archives are in the way that artists have been thinking of them and engaging with them, artists such as yourself. Uh, I want to really start with this key question today, which is what is an archive? And I want you all to think of the immediate images that are conjured in your mind when that word comes up and kind of stay with that image or those keywords and reflect on them throughout the session today. So when I simply typed in archive on Google search, I was flooded with these images of these long halls with stacks of files and folders, many that had locks and seals, and of course, not a person in sight. And perhaps this can give us insight into the way in which archives have been imagined and rightfully so as inaccessible as containing information that is stored away and not allowed circulation. Um, in fact, Ariela Azulai, a theorist of visual culture, spoke about exactly this in her essay on the archive, which I'd shared with you all, and I'd be happy to sort of discuss uh, when we're interacting. She talked about how this image, the images that I showed you, or this sort of long haul image, encapsulates what can be called an abstract archive where there's no trace of the kind of people who created it, nor those who use it. So it's envisage just kind of acting on its own, of its own accord, as if it was in an isolated conversation with itself. She then refers to French philosopher Derrida, uh, who has a famous essay called Archive Fever, where he talks about the figure of the archon. Uh, an archon is the one who bears the position of power in the sense of access to these archives. Uh, and besides, in some ways, what is preserved, what is erased, and what is not allowed to circulate in the present. So the materials also have to have a sense, have to have enough of a sense of pastness, not to ruffle the law and power in the present. 
But then as she elaborates on the material archive rather than this abstract archive, she says that instead of asking what is an archive, which in a way leaves the archive outside and retains it as this fortress outside our world, um, it sort of makes us, it's pilgrims that we have to sort of visit. She says, and that she says that she wants to ask why an archive or what do we look for in an archive? and only then answer what an archive is. She then talks about how um, archive fever as we experience it in the present has in a sense changed. Uh, there's been so many more image producers documenting the surroundings through technologies of cell phones. There's, and she says that because of this, there's a new kind of archive contract wherein citizens have the right to share not only what is stored in the archive, but also have a right to be involved in producing and depositing materials in the archive. And she says that certain figures, researchers or artists such as yourself, are engaging with the archive in a way that really questions that abstract, isolated image. And here I just want to read a quote. Their interest, there being these artists and researchers, interest is not in the past as something over and done, but rather to the ways of intervention in it its transmission, the picture it gives about the being together in the world. The interest in the archive expresses curiosity, but also dissatisfaction, doubt and suspicion, arousing their interest in the structure of the archive, the forms of control it produces, or the possibilities of unraveling and recomposing it, no less than in that which is stored inside, as if it were there on its own. So artists have really been engaging with the archive. Um, and again, we're going to get deeper into it today. And it takes very different forms, uh, which can be conceptual or can be quite literal. Um, so Azulai cites the example of Wali Drad, who is a contemporary media artist from Lebanon. And Drad's work is informed by his upbringing in Lebanon during the Civil War, which was from 1975 to 91. And sort of by the socio-economic and military policies that have shaped the Middle East in the past few decades. So he is very situated and located in the work that he does. Um, and as part of the Atlas Group, uh, a 15 year project exploring the contemporary history of Lebanon, Raad has produ produced these fictionalized photographs, videotapes, notebooks and lectures that related to real events and authentic research in audio, film, and photographic archives in Lebanon and elsewhere. And these photographic and video documents in the public realm provoke us to think of the role of memory and narrative within discourses of conflict. Um, the speculation, speculative and the fictional alongside with the historical and the so-called documentary. In this image that you see here, for example, he's emphasized the bullets that attacked buildings predominantly in the areas that he grew up in. And um, I'm going to be sharing more examples such as these with you. But before that, I'm going to hand it over to Nupur to give a little context on our work at Asia Art Archive. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Samira. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nupur Desai, a researcher with uh, Asia Art Archive in India. and I'm in, based in uh, New Delhi. Uh, so as Samira took us through the idea of the archive and its uh, various forms and modes that artists uh, have been engaging with and have produced, I'm briefly going to talk about how it forms part of what we do at uh, Asia Art Archive. Uh, just to introduce you to the organization, uh, Asia Art Archive is a not-for-profit independent organization and an online archive. Uh, it was founded in the year 2000 in Hong Kong uh, with the mandate to document and digitize recent histories of art in the region. Uh, and we are digital primarily because it just ensures that even if we are collecting material on, say, China or Pakistan, somebody sitting in India or anywhere else in the world can access it online easily. Uh, and in the current moment, it has become all the more important to have these kinds of resources available and easily accessible uh, for all of us. So it's a resource for artists, students, and researchers. And like any other organization or archive, we have a, a origin story or a legend. Um, in the late 1990s, uh, Claire Tsu, who is our founder, 
uh, she was doing her master's at SOAS uh, in London. Uh, and as part of her master's dissertation, she was looking at contemporary Chinese art. Uh, so for her research, uh, as part of her dissertation fieldwork, when she went back to China and Hong Kong, uh, she realized that there were really no publicly accessible collections for researchers and writers pursuing their research on contemporary Chinese art. And so that was kind of an impetus to form Asia Art Archive. Um, and it, it was started in one room with two bookshelves. Uh, and over the years, it has grown. Uh, and, and today, kind of we have researchers working in different parts of Asia in, in order to bring forth the less visible histories of, of art uh, through documentation and archiving. And we also have two other places, Asia Art Archive in India, uh, in New Delhi, where Samira and I work from. Uh, and uh, also, we have Asia Art Archive in America, which is based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, next slide, please. So just to kind of uh, give you a sense of what we do and how we do it, uh, we do research to frame our collections. Uh, but the idea behind Asia Art Archive is not to kind of build a collection and wait for artists or students to come and pull out material. Uh, and from the outset, the collections were thought alongside a robust series of, of programs, such as exhibitions, uh, workshops, seminars, to activate our, our collections. Uh, we also work with educators and we build educational resources uh, for art educators and students, especially in the past one year, it's been very crucial and we have um, sh shared some exercises developed by artists um, that could be done at home by art students, by art educators. And as Samira will be talking about artist exercises in detail uh, later on. Uh, so apart from that, we have a large library collection of books, catalogs, periodicals, and zines in Hong Kong, and a small collection in India that is accessible and available for free. Uh, next slide, please. So when we think about research collections, how do we frame our, our research and our programming is, is a crucial question. Uh, and it is through what we call them our content priorities that you see here um, that help us kind of conceptualize our, our research collections and uh, programs. So we considered art schools, uh, art education, art writing, and exhibition histories as sites of construction of art historical discourse in the region. Uh, and when I say region, I'm, I'm talking about Asia, not just geographically, but also uh, uh, through networks, through connections, and, and through kind of movements. Uh, so pedagogy, art schools, that, that kind of played a crucial role as a sites of experimentation that shaped art education and artistic practices. Art writing, because the circulation of ideas around modern and contemporary art happened through debates uh, that took place in multiple languages, shaping multiple modernisms. Uh, and in, in, in the absence of art institutions or, or big museums, exhibitions and their histories kind of become a form of writing art historical narrative. Uh, performance as, uh, art is, is another crucial area, uh, as the ephemeral nature of, of this form kind of creates challenges towards the idea of an archive, and how do we kind of document this time-bound, space-bound, ephemeral form. Apart from that, uh, our collections also reflect on the role of women artists, uh, women practitioners, and their engagements, as they are not kind of well represented in the mainstream art historical discourse. Complex geographies is not just about artists traveling to different geographic locations, but also about movement of ideas, exchanges, networks that shape their uh, practices. And innovation uh, through tradition is, is where artists have been engaging with traditional forms and techniques and revisiting them through their own artistic and pedagogical engagements. And these areas have emerged through our conversations and internal reflections over the years, and it's still an ongoing process. Uh, next slide, please. So we saw some images of, of state archives and institutional archives uh, in the beginning. And also kind of touched upon how artists engage with uh, with the idea of the archive uh, in the beginning. Uh, but for us, uh, another important aspect to address here is, is what do artists' personal archives look like? Uh, if you imagine your own studio space, uh, your drawers, tables, cupboards, your room, or even your computers, what are the objects and materials that you kind of collect? And then how does that inform your art making process? So they may look like, like this, chaotic, dusty spaces with huge piles of papers, boxes, folders, paper rolls lying everywhere. Uh, but don't let the image fool you. Uh, though they look messy, unkempt, uh, there is a very clear organizational structure 
here, uh, but most of the times it is something for us to kind of decipher and, and decrypt. Uh, next slide, please. So when you enter this, this space, uh, when you open this archive, uh, what you see is it's not an artwork, not a painting, not a sculpture, but it would be a sketchbook or a contact sheet or a report or pages from a diary or a letter. And it's exciting to see as all this is part of the artistic research and art making process of that particular artist. And it's their personal material, their personal stories, their imaginations, their obsessions. Uh, so for example, Habit Chun, uh, a Hong Kong based artist, compulsively documented each and every exhibition in Hong Kong for over 50 years. And his archive kind of carries all those photographs uh, from which you could actually build a history of exhibitions in Hong Kong. Uh, or India-based artists like Vivan Sundaram has collected catalogs of exhibitions and materials around artist initiatives over a period, uh, which kind of gives us a glimpse into the lesser known histories of, of uh, art practice. So at Asia Art Archive, one of the primary sites that we focus on digitizing and, and bringing out in public are the personal archives of artists, curators, art critics, and art educators. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of uh, artist Nilima Sheikh's archival collections. The images that you see uh, on the left are from exhibition of her archival materials that we organized in Hong Kong a couple of years back. Uh, the exhibition was called Lines of Light. Uh, that presented one of the important aspects of her practice, uh, her artistic research into various techniques and visual and textual elements. And it is now a well-known fact that Nilima uses stencils, uh, which she prepares with uh, practitioners from Mathura, traditional uh, Sanji artist. And what you see here are, are these displayed in, in a way to kind of understand how it informs her art making process. And she has kept and preserved these stencils and other such visual references uh, in her personal collection in these files and folders that you see on the in the other image uh, on the right hand side painstakingly organized sorted titled and numbered and we realize that artists themselves produce their own systems and structures to keep the materials in a certain order neatly arranged folders tapes light boxes files documents and, and so on and because unlike public collections, uh, when artists decide to keep archives, the main focus of it is to be able to retrieve the materials whenever they need it. So when people keep archival collections in their homes, the intended audience for that is themselves. Uh, next slide, please. And on the other hand, uh, when we work on these collections, uh, what we do is to primarily transform them into accessible archival collections. A collection that could be accessed in by anyone uh, who has access to internet, of course. Uh, and digital is the is the key here. So the physical material, these papers, images, stencils, 35 mm slides, are scanned or photographed with equipment to digitize and make them freely available uh, so that the materials can circulate easily. And this is our digitization uh, station uh, in Hong Kong, uh, where you can see research and collections team are kind of working with the materials. And after digitizing, we arrange these materials in what we call tree structure, the image that you see on the right. Uh, a system that kind of branches out and grows further when you open it up, uh, while focusing on the, the crucial aspects of an artist or curator's practice and the larger milieu that they were part of. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, when we kind of work on these archives, we work with a certain format, the tree structure that I spoke about. And it becomes a way to segregate and sort data to organize the materials for easy access. So this structure is, is what makes a collection into an archive. And what you see here is the first folder level for Milima Sheikh's archive, where you can see folders such as uh, artwork images, solo catalogs, group exhibition catalogs, theater collections, uh, collaborations, research and travel, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. And so on, and, and each folder kind of branches out in, a, in subfolders. So when, when the tree structure opens up, it takes you inside the archive to the next level, where it expands into subfolders. Uh, for instance, what kind of visual references uh, that comes across in Nilima Sheikh's archive, ranging from, if you see the second level, um, the, the image in the middle, 
uh, you would see different kinds of uh, visual references, including Mughal miniature, Pahadi painting, European painting, Persian miniature, Nepalese painting, and so on. And in the third slide, what you see when you open it further, uh, you would see it takes you to kind of this plethora of images or sets of documents from the specific category. So what you see here is, is like screenshots from our hard drives, uh, which then get replicated on our website exactly in this manner, in the form of the tree structure uh, that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll stop here and, and over to you, Samira, to kind of take us through artists who are engaging with, with archives uh, through their practice. Thanks, Nupur. Um, just to notice that I, because I'm sharing screen, I'm not really able to see the chat. So if there's something that you want to ask or if you can't hear clearly, just unmute yourself and interrupt me um, so I can respond better. Um, but I think what Nupur has sort of shared with you is the apparatus with which we work. So the apparatus on the one hand are these crowded artist studios full of files and folders. and we take that as a starting point to sort of create a digital back end um, where you can access these materials. And we also not, not fully rep try to replicate, but we are trying to give an idea and an impression of what the actual archive of the artist was like. And we often work closely with them wherever it's possible. Um, and Asia Archive's work is very much sort of in tune with what I refer to as this recent moment or this recent turn where we, our, our description of archives has expanded uh, and we're beginning to look much more at the personal and the social rather than just the state or governance. Um, and, and this has been particularly empowering in locations where there seems to be a lack of official infrastructure for archiving and that has led to a creativity in how, how archives are constructed. Um, as Azulai has hinted towards in her essay, um, since the 1960s, artists have taken a particular interest in archives. Uh, and they're also especially interested in archives that look at histories that are not usually documented in official terms, stories that are often avoided, erased, or not considered worthy by dominant forces of that moment, um, often by the state. So here in these images, I'm showing the work of Sri Lankan contemporary artist Tisha Nathanan, who is also an art educator and he teaches at the University of Jaffna. So his work here, the Cabinet of um, Resistance, contains 30 drawers, each of which contain narratives, photographs and drawings of citizens of Sri Lanka that experienced over three decades of civil war till 2009. So often when we study the history of war, it's very much about major events and um, people's everyday lives and citizens just sort of become statistics. And this work is an inversion of that. So the source for the artist uh, for this work included visiting photography studios and letterpress studios to find stories and conversations. Um, especially since there was such a breakdown of technology during that moment, this was sort of the predominant way of people to communicate with each other. So one of the stories, if you open one of these drawers, for example, is about a 50 year old woman who learned to cycle for the first time because all the public transport of Sri Lanka had failed. Or there's another story about how there was an embargo on potatoes. So a chef reinterpreted a traditional curry that uh, that uses. Um, so basically, he reinterpreted the recipe with to use chickpeas instead, and it was such a hit that the recipe itself has changed. And of course, these drawers also contain stories of immense pain and loss. But the key point is that the artist bring for, brings forth how we all live with and through history every day. He's also creating an infrastructure for accessing these stories through these archive drawers. But if you look at them, they also have this sort of domestic intimacy. And I feel that this is something that the artist has, is purposefully sort of uh, played with. So Song Dong's archive uh, work sort of give, is an example of artists that also use literal materials and objects to talk about archives. So Song Dong is an artist from Beijing and China. Uh, and a part of his practice has been about reconciling or coming to terms with his parents. And this work here, Waste Not, is about his late mother, where he displayed around 10,000 objects that she had hoarded. Um, and these included things like 
use toothpaste or thousands of bottle caps that you can see over here. Um, and this was the archive of his mother's life in a sense, but really it was an archive of the space of the home. And in a sense, also the mentality of generations and the kind of experience that they had that really led them to sort of hoard these materials. Interestingly, it's also an archive of the design of products and items themselves and how they change over time. So Afra Shafiq is a contemporary artist based in Goa, and her work is very engaged with narratives and stories that emerge from artistic research with archive, archives, and she often renders these in digital formats. So one such project of hers, which you can actually visit online, is called Enter Sultana's Reality. And she's created this fantastic website interface where you can engage with the selections of, selection of images from the visual archive at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Kolkata. So Afra spent a lot of time with the images in the archive and she noticed these, she noticed certain patterns. For example, she saw that a large collection of lithographs showed women that were sitting or lounging, uh, gazing out of windows, or there were prints where women were just having a really good time among themselves. And in some, in fact, in many, they were just reading books. And the artist wondered what do these depictions mean and how can we look at them from a different gaze that isn't um, sexualized or romanticized. So Afra has activated this archives and its stories in the form of this interactive mythical website where one is navigating an archive images and stories that we don't often get to hear. So the Faye Richards photo archive was created by Zoe Leonard in collaboration with a filmmaker called Cheryl Dunier, and it comprises of 82 images that document the life story of an imaginary person, a black lesbian actress and blues singer named Faye Richards. So I'm actually showing this as an instance of where their um, artists really are speculating and performing an archive. So Zoe Leonard's narrative unfolds as a series of photographs that track the actress's life as a teenager and then as a Hollywood screen star through the civil rights era uh, when her film career was obstructed by racism and finally to her old age as a forgotten figure. So each film still, candid shot, family photograph and public publicity picture has been staged and styled for optical realism with period specific clothing, makeup and lighting. The captions were produced on a vintage typewriter and many of the images were manipulated to stimulate aging of the materials themselves. So by including a casting list of the women hired to play Richards, Leonard acknowledges the project's artifice, encouraging the viewer to recognize that she had to create a story that is fictional, but rings true because the real life counterparts of such stories went undocumented. Where there are no archives or documentation, artists turn to the possibility of the fictional and the speculative to create archives that they wish to see and a past and therefore future that they wish to imagine. So Camp Studio, perhaps you're familiar with them. Uh, they define themselves not as an artist collective, but rather a studio based in Mumbai. And they actually work with a number of individuals and organizations as a part of their work. And they think a lot about ownership and authority as challenging sites for artistic practice. And again, this in reference to those sort of locked archives that we were seeing at the beginning. They engage with questions, claims, and potentials around, the in, around infrastructure and the material systems and tools that sort of make infrastructure. So they work directly with things like electricity, transport, trade, archives, video, radio, and the internet. And they develop ways to think of all of these as not sort of se separate and monumental, but as integrated within human life and beyond the network as its representative thought model. Um, and in fact, they really do work to develop archives, not only intervene in them, but actively create them as artists, archivists. So an example over here uh, is the project PAD.ma, PADMA, short for Public Access Digital Media Archive. And it's an online archive of densely text annotated video material, uh, primarily footage and not finished films. And so this entire collection is available online and can be viewed for free. And actually, if you're interested in Indian cinema, there's very few films that I've searched here that I actually haven't been able to find. 
And what they do is they've actually gathered footage directly from filmmakers or other people that were involved in it. So you don't actually see the film, but you see all the sort of parts and processes that go into making the film. And all of these have been annotated by artists, by those individuals and figures that they've invited to annotate this. And also this is open to annotation by public when we sort of entered the archive. So th this works at multiple levels. What they're saying is we want to gather, gather all that is sort of missed out when you see the final documentary or video or the film. But also we just don't want it to simply be there for people to see but for them to participate in it. In fact, some of these videos even have overwriting on top of them, on top of the uh, underlining, scratching out corrections. So uh, in that sense, it's a fabulous example of an open access sort of pirate mode um, way of working. Uh, and perhaps you, a lot of you are also familiar with the work of Dianita Singh, who is a photographer based in India. And she's photographed relentlessly for the last four decades. And I think at the moment she's working on her own archive. But here I want to focus on a particular selection from the archive, which is called the file room. And these are photographs uh, of archives, particularly bureaucratic archives. So mostly these Sarkari sort of offices. And her work is about a lot, actually. But here I want to connect it to my first question about how her work really relays the architecture of an archive. And it's also poetic that in, it conveys that in these piles and papers, in these piles and stacks and files and folders are actually people's histories. And these are, there's so many are lying sort of forgotten. And then this, there's this sort of presence of nostalgia in these images and the kind of past that they could have promised. For example, some of these letters, if you open them, are a lot of hopeful letters by people requesting the government or these offices for something that they'd want. Um, this is my final example sort of of artists uh, working with archives, but this is an example we often use and we often wield when we ask, how do we define an archive or what is an archive? So in one and three chairs, Joseph Kossuth, this is a work from 1965, he exhibits a chair which serves as an object that could be an art object or a museum that can be later, or an object that can be later collected by a museum. He clicks a photograph of the work which serves as a kind of documentation of this object. And this would be considered an archive of the chair's existence in a sense. And the third part of the display is the printed sort of dictionary definition of the chair. In a sense, the textual description of the object. And this would be the secondary resource of sorts on the, on the material, perhaps one that could be found in a library. So through his work, we can see the different but sort of related ideas between what is in the museum, what is in an archive, and what is in a library. Um, so I think this also shows just sort of what Nupur was saying, that we at AA collect everything around the object, but not the object itself. So we're interested in sort of taking ideas around the objects, taking them away, and putting them online and circulating them for free. Okay, Nupur, I'm going to hand it over to you to maybe share the way artists have intervened in Asia at Archives Collections. Thanks. Thanks, Samira. Uh, so, I mean, these conversations on archives and artists engaging with the idea of archiving archival material open up so many new areas and ways in which one could think about it, the materials, the infrastructures and the processes. And one of the ways is, is the exhibitionary mode. So a few years back, we invited artist Shilpa Gupta. Uh, and then most of you uh, uh, must be aware of, of Shilpa's practice to engage with AA's collection, the research collections. And our former co colleague um, and then researcher, Sabi Ahmed, began this conversation with Shilpa about a possible artistic response to materials in, in artists' archives, uh, specifically from, from India collections. So these are primarily focusing on artists from 1960s till the 1980s. So artists such as Gulam Mohammad Sheikh, K.D. Subramanian, Jyoti Bhatt. And what Shilpa wanted to do was to look beyond the archival material. So she, I mean, Shilpa is someone who has worked with most of these artists from uh, from senior generation of artists as an intern, as their assistant when she was a student or later on as a, as a young practitioner. So she was interested in bringing out materials from the archive, but also to engage in dialogue with these artists whose archives we had collected. And also in addition to interview the artists who were not 
yet part of the archival collection. And through these series of conversations, their personal stories kind of surfaced and became part of the narrative of her exhibition, uh, which in turn kind of helped Shilpa construct stories and reimagine certain moments in art history in the form of this exhibition uh, titled that photo we never got. And the photo that you, the image that you see here is from its iteration uh, in, in Delhi at the uh, India Art Fair. Uh, next slide, please. And the exhibition traveled to Hong Kong, to Bombay, uh, with its multiple iterations. Uh, and the next image uh, that we see is from Hong Kong library space. Uh, so yeah, can you just, yeah, sorry. Uh, so this is image from, from Hong Kong library space. Uh, and what you see here is, is these stories, these images were kind of inserted into this library space, occupying the, the space horizontally as well as vertically, creating multiple new narratives within this space. Uh, and then there are like many, many stories. Each letter, each photo, each document has a story behind it. And you could start from a different entry point every time and build a new uh, narrative around it. Uh, next slide, please. So all these archives and, and photographic images from the archive kind of present overlapping histories, fraught friendships, collaborations, fallouts. And Shilpa kind of explored the terrain of, of intense personal relations and the space of the intimate. So when you put these stories next to each other, these stories kind of surface sometimes as annotations, sometimes as quotations, through which you would also see a plethora of, of art historical narratives. So one such story is about artist Sudhir Patwardhan uh, from Bombay who consistently kind of conflicted his, his position in various fields as, as a medical practitioner, uh, as an activist, connect with, uh, connecting with non-art community uh, audiences from the city as an artist. And he talks about uh, how something uh, was, was always outside of what he did. And, and I quote, the outside was always beckoning. That, that was where I should be, you know, and, and it's, it's kind of fascinating to read about this, this idea of the outside being so challenging, yet so enthralling. And, and I began wondering if that is what Shilpa was kind of precisely trying to get at and to connect what is outside of the archive with what is inside of the archive in order to reimagine the narrative. Uh, next slide, please. And in the process, the narratives were kind of amplified by documents from AA's collections as well as I think we lost Nupur. There. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if it was just me who could hear a Nupur. Is she in the meeting? Uh, the background is there, but I don't <laughs> see Nupur. Hi, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. There was a power cut. Oh no! It's are you? I. Are you okay, Nupur? Do you want me to go on or uh, you're good? No, no, fine. I have connected to my uh, mobile hotspot okay. now. Okay. So I don't know uh, until, I mean. We heard we you... heard you up to the latest for this slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, uh, I mean, in the process, the narratives kind of, I was just saying that how they amplified uh, where the documents from AES collections as well as the materials that Shilpa kind of gathered from these artists were put together. Uh, and and you, what you see here are these small boxes are our kind of annotations uh, and stories and fragments shared by the interviewed artists pointing towards many more propositions. So for example, Boycott Academy, the image that you see on the left uh, is, is about kinds of initiatives that artists were kind of organizing against state institutions. Or another example uh, was where artists wanted to position themselves as artist photographers, uh, being different from photojournalists, which kind of led to the organization of uh, exhibition called Painters with a Camera in the 1960s. So many of these different stories kind of emerged through these images and texts. Uh, next slide, please. So Nupur? one of the, yeah. the archival collections that we have is Gulab Muhammad Sheikh's archive. Uh, and the image that you see uh, on the on the right hand side kind of shows postcards collected by him uh, during his Europe visits. 
uh, and and also a quote by Mili Mashik stating a funny incident where in one party they suddenly realized that almost all of them were uh, Gulam Mohammad Sheikh students, and that reminded her of of this map of Europe that he had shared, uh, the image that you see on the left hand side. So a graph paper where there is no image or the missing map of Europe, uh, with just a, a small kind of annotation box. So when we started digitizing uh, Gulam Mohammad Sheikh's archive in uh, 2011. Our researchers back then kind of came across a map of Europe that he used to carry with him during his student days in London. And, and he traveled across Europe uh, with this map to visit museums, galleries, cathedrals. Uh, and these travels kind of got etched on that map, the routes, the directions, the distances, the different sites. And interestingly, that map became a reference point for, for many young artists and students who went to Europe after him. Uh, but when Shilpa was working on this project, this particular image, uh, the particular map, wasn't there in, in uh, Gulam Mohammed Sheikh's personal collection. And we were unable to, to locate this map. It had just disappeared. Uh, yet Shilpa kind of decided to put a blank graph paper to indicate its presence, but its apparent absence. Uh, and the annotation then gained the emblematic presence in the, in the archive. Uh, next slide, please. And in this exhibition, um, Shilpa also kind of included bibliographies and, and artist reading lists that tell us about what kind of books they were reading. Um, so the image that you see on the right kind of shows notes, pencil marks, jottings on the books, again, as a form of annotating the textual and visual references. And the image on the left, uh, you see, see again a small quotation from Sudhir Patwadhan, who talks about how he and his peers like Nalini Malani and Geet Patel were interested in philosophical writings by Camus, Sartre, Freud, and the Frankfurt School. And they were reading it, connecting it with the larger uh, questions of modern and contemporary art. But at the same time, these readings also kind of informed them about child psychology. So these readings kind of had an inherent place for them as young parents in the 1970s. Uh, Next slide, please. So the last story that I'm going to share with you is from a collective of women artists. Um, and Nalini Malani, uh, she shared an amazing story with Shilpa. So in the 1980s, Nalini kind of came up with this idea of, of only women artists exhibition. Uh, and she sent a postcard to Arpita Singh saying, let's do this exhibition. And in the response to that postcard, Arpita Singh sent a story of an owl, which says, uh, and there is in the small an uh, annotation box, Arpita Singh basically says, there is an owl called Oscar and he keeps holding on to my pallu and crying. And why did she do that? She explained that in just one line, saying that this exhibition is completely an absurd idea and it demands an equally absurd response. And hence, I'm sending this story of an owl. And it was indeed absurd at that point of time, but they came together after reaching out to several artists, finally four artists that you see in this photograph, Nalini Malani, Arpita Singh, Madhavi Parit and Nilima Sheikh came together to put an, together an exhibition in 1989 called Through a Looking Glass. And what is fascinating is that if you look at the history of artist collectives, this four women artist collective had more exhibitions than any other artist collective in India at that point of time. And yet their history was quickly written out of the art historical canon. So when Shilpa was working on this project, this particular photo wasn't there earlier in, in uh, Asia Darkai's uh, collection. Uh, but when Shilpa kind of um, started working on this, she dug it out through her personal relationships and these long conversations with artists. And this iconic photo then became part of this exhibition. Uh, and that is why the archive and the photo in the archive, uh, perhaps the photo we never got in the archive, makes it all the more kind of crucial to open up the conversations. And this understudied exhibition later on entered the archive through this iconic photo, but also other documents related to the exhibitions, such as the catalog, correspondence, and became part of the Nilima Sheikh archive, uh, which is available online now. So there are so many ways in which uh, one could encounter an archive, engage with it, amplify it. Uh, and though the idea of the archive comes across as a solid, unchanging entity, it actually provides with umpteen possibilities uh, with its fragmentary nature, with its gaps and absences, uh, its imperfectness, which can be looked at as, as multiple clues and entry points for us to open it up, extend it, and, and expand it. Uh, and the most fascinating part is that the, the playfulness with which Shilpa, uh, I think, did it. Yeah, over to you, Samira. Thanks.
So we're going to shift uh, quickly from the context of Baroda and Bombay and go to Hong Kong via the archive of the late Habib Chun. Um, so Hao was known primarily, that's him, uh, as a sculptor and a printmaker, but he actually had a parallel practice. Nupur has spoken very briefly at the beginning about this, of photographing exhibitions that he attended. Um, and our colleagues in Hong Kong have called him this sort of, everyone just thought he was this uncle that was going to every exhibition and documenting relentlessly. And I mean, clicking photographs of each work, each text that was happening in Hong Kong for a few decades. Um, and here we can also see his own sort of positioning uh, as a photographer of art uh, and among art. Um, so, and actually his archive was only discovered after his passing in the 2000s. And it's actually a treasure trove of Hong Kong art history. And this is an installation of his work that was shown at the Shanghai uh, Biennale. But I'm only showing this to kind of express the density of the photographs that you can um, that you can see. But also I want to show this image as a sort of contrast to the images that we looked at at the beginning of those closed hallways uh, and doors versus this outward facing sort of direct imaging uh, form. Uh, I don't think I could ever really justify showing Havik Chun's archive in a conversation like this, but this is just to sort of zoom in and show you what the, what the different slides and the contact sheets of his work and his documentation look like. And you can access all of these online. Um, so really, this is just to show you that he was photographing all the time. Um, but I'm introducing this archive and this artist to talk about another artist who went into the archive and responded, and responded to it. So I've already spoken about the artist. It's Walid Raj from Lebanon. And he was invited as an artist in residence at the archive in 2014 in Hong Kong, and he drove right into the almost 8,000 materials and documents in Habik Chun's archive. And Nupo showed you, actually those images of that studio was from Habik Chun's studio, um, and what the archive looks like. So actually he went into the physical archive. And when Raad came into the archive, there were these large sets of magazines, interior, fashion, lifestyle, and no one really, like none of the art archivists really knew what to do with them. So one of the things that Raj started to notice that was that these weren't simply the artist collection of magazines, but in fact, Ha had been creating very subtle collages in them. And he was crisscrossing these from different magazines. And they were done in such an unobtrusively light way that it was, it's quite easy to miss. And Raj was actually the first one to notice this, not any researcher from the archive. And it changed an entire section of the collection and approach to the archive. So this is sort of what it looks like. You're not even able to tell, but now that I've said it, I guess it's a bit obvious. So sort of putting in materials like these. Um, so this is another magazine. And sort of this is his intervention and collage in them. So for how basically fashion editorials from local magazines resonated with modernist masters like Matisse and Picasso. And they revealed also to us looking at the archive, the ways in which Hong Kong had been profoundly influenced by Western modern modernism. And this stands in stark contrast when you look at the archives of, of mainland China from that moment. And his own work was deeply influenced by modernism and abstract art. Um, and we're also able to, in a sense, see the impact of modernist art and how it transcends boundaries. So also the way in which how we're sort of working with these collages was sort of this border crossing effect where things that made no sense together were actually brought together. And these uh, random, seemingly random magazines became a site for us to trace these. And an artist like Wali Brat brings our attention to it. So these are some of these magazines. So as his response, not only did he sort of bring attention to this, he actually created an exhibition in our Hong Kong library that he titled Section 39 underscore Index 37 Trouble C. And in that, he retraces the way in which a Lebanese artist by the name of Suha Trabulsi draws inspiration from his exchanges with Habik Chun and Ha's collage notebooks to create a series of sculptural spaces, as well as Trabulsi's application of the collage method that he, uh, in his approximation of modern Arab art. Um, these sculptures were made in the library sh shelves to sort of evoke the way in which Ha had created collages in his books, 
But the twist in this is that this Suha Trouble Sea is actually like this totally fictional character that Walid Rudd made up. And his practice is so much about making up fictional characters. And Walid Rudd calls Suha his collaborator. And he said that Suha and Habik Chun had been exchanging correspondence and letters for many decades. And Suha knew that these collage books were happening. And Suha was interpreting these as sculptures um, using Arab modernism as a reference. Um, so these are some of the sculptures in the library. And I guess these sculptures are also to sculptures within the books is to show one is you have to look carefully at what you're looking at, even when you're reading a book, there's many layers. Um, and also to sort of evoke again the collagic method that exists within within the books in the library. So uh, I realize we're a little bit out of time. So I'm quickly going to wrap up on that note to talk about this program that we're doing at the moment, which is called Artist Exercises, Connecting Artist Educators Across Geography. So this was actually um, conceptualized during the pandemic and a lot when a lot of us were working online. I mean, we're still working online, but we were thinking about the fact that our archives uh, circulate predominantly digitally and are accessed digitally. So how can we think about how these can actually uh, be used and be helpful on site in different locations, particularly locations across Asia? And we also thought that we really do want to work with people, individuals, communities that we haven't worked with before. So we took out this open call for artist exercises where we invited artist educators in the region to look at our archives, to propose an idea where they could use really anything in the archives. It could be one photograph, one text, or they could use several collections to, to set up a sort of workshop with their learners on site that we would support. Um, and so we're actually in the process of this. We have an amazing group of people. Uh, we have artist educators from Singapore, Malaysia, from um, uh, Indonesia, from Chinatown in Boston. And actually we have someone, we also have Anga Art Collective. I know that Northeast Lightbox uh, know them well, uh, but they're also looking at site-specific materiality in our archives and creating a workshop around them. So I'll definitely let you all know when these artist exercises come out. But right before that, I want to show really what does this artist exercise mean? So we'd had a set of these artist exercises earlier when we went into the pandemic and everyone was at home, where we invited artists to create exercises that people could do at home on their own. And one of these, for example, Think Time by Chang Yuchen, by artist Chang Yuchen, uh, they put a series of exercises that we could use in instructions. But one of them, for example, was set a stopwatch for four minutes and 33 seconds. Do nothing but still, but sit still in this period of time. Discuss what happened in that time frame, if any. How did you feel? And for us, even just this one sort of prompt and question makes us think so much about how you can think about time and the passage of time. And it's also the scale in which we're interested in thinking about how artists work with archives. So it doesn't have to be the sort of large scale creating an entire archive sort of thing, but it can sometimes be just this one small prompt of looking at an archive differently or pointing to something that no one else has seen as yet. Um, so that's all from me. We've spoken for very long. I'm just going to stop presenting. Uh, but I know that we, a lot of our references are actually visual, visual art, sort of contemporary art references. And I know that you all work across disciplines, textile, design, theater, ethnography. So. We're also actually really interested in hearing about how you work with archives and the fields that you work in um, and how they sort of intersect as artistic practice. Yeah, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Samira, uh, for this very detailed uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, maybe I would like to invite uh, also Laptian Kumam uh, to Pranami and Aku to also speak of their experiences with the NEN archives and with the whole project, and maybe we can break the conversation out in that manner. Would you like to go first, Labdiang? No, I mean, as of me, I think I'm kind of, it, it was a very con condensed, you know, uh, session as such. So I'm still kind of uh, going through, you know, digesting a little more and also just kind of reflecting as to you know how uh, this residency kind of really work been working so far i mean um, we've sit, we've been sitting in different places and we haven't 
you know, sort of put our hands on the physical archive that exists out there, which uh, Dev Dev and Rishikesh have the, you know, privilege to have kind of access, seen, touch, photograph, right? So uh, working in a very digital dimension that way, and also trying to get a feel of it. So as of me, I think uh, I'm still kind of, uh, you know, uh, thinking of ways to how, uh, you know, this thought processes in the last few weeks kind of resonate or not resonate with what we've just seen. Yeah. But all in all, it was, it was very diverse and condensed. And I think it opened up ways to kind of rethink, relook also, uh, you know, relook, reflect what we have been, uh, you know, any, in any case, uh, sort of uh, working together and or individually. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Samira and Nupur, for that uh, really, really like eye-opening uh, presentation and, and look into the archives. I think it's, you know, I know I've been struggling a lot um, how to find ways and means of finding like an in-way into how I interact with the archives. And today's conversation has really opened up so many things. Um, it was really, I really uh, found the article you had sent um that was really that was very interesting um just to share i don't know uh, just to start a conversation my work maybe i'll talk a bit about my interaction with the archives uh with the concept of the archives in the past just briefly and then move on to ideas that have been brewing in my mind with men um the my last project actually before the pandemic was a theater project was a research um, as practice project with artists from Wales. And we were looking at the history of the Welsh missionaries, the Welsh and the Khasis, uh, you know, how the Welsh missionaries sort of came to Meghalaya and brought Christianity with them. And we actually looked at this history through the archives. And these are like documents that the Welsh missionaries had sort of, you know, whether they were letters, whether they were, uh, lists of baptisms, of conversions, whether they were photographs, there were memoirs, and all of these um, archives. So we had gone to Aberystwyth uh, um, Museum. And a lot of these archives, you know, this is a history that, you know, it happened in the Khasi Hills, a lot of Chris Christianity, sort of how it came about, also coming to, we are predominantly an oral culture. And for us, like documentation, I think memory is a very, um, I look at memory as a space of, of an archive as well. We sort of uh, speak our stories or we tell the stories from one generation to generation. So through this project, we really looked at how like uh, the Welsh, you know, as part of sort of this, um, through Christianity, they're also part of the British Empire and, you know, colonization and all that, but they came with sort of a, goodwill intention of bringing christianity or lightening you know enlightening uh enlightening the so-called tribals in a way because they were there were words like i remember reading these words descriptions of the khasi people and all that so um there's something that i'd like to share that uh, had triggered um i think reading the article when you talk about you know photographs do you look at is it just a photograph of, you know, is this a wanted man? Is this a refugee or this, or do you actually uh, think, you know, you sort of give a name to who this person is uh, and sort of, um, you know, the history, the background of that person. And I remember this, uh, we had performed it. It was a photograph of uh, a missionary and his wife. They were two missionaries, Welsh missionaries, and they had taken the first um, a Khasi boy to be converted, sort of an evangelist, to be converted to Christianity. They had taken him to England. And there's a photograph of uh, the missionary who was uh, Lewis, William Lewis, I think, the missionary and uh, his wife. And in between them is Ular Singh, a Khasi boy, you know. And we did this exercise, actually, we performed it as part of the uh, theatre performance as well. We did this exercise of what would happen like 20 seconds before the photograph before they settle into the position like we're sitting like this okay so 20 seconds 
how do they settle into the position and 20 seconds forward. So we were kind of looking at, and we also looked at photographs of how the missionaries sort of photograph Khasi girls, you know, like in their traditional attire and also this very sort of way of sitting, you know, the very colonial sort of frame. And we kept trying to see um, what could be like these movements before the photograph, before that is captured and after. And it really, um, yeah, it had a narrative. So many narratives came out there that was so um, interesting that, that, you know, I still now, when I, I think when I had performed till 2020, we were performing this piece, we were traveling around. And I think reading your article again, I kept, kept thinking like, what is the movement uh, in, in sort of these very static documents that we have, you know, whether it's writings, whether it's photographs, it's images, it's, uh, what could have been the possibility of movement there? in a way. Um, yeah, that's something I think I wanted to share. And uh, so it's, I, I think with the NEN archives, um, there have been like uh, certain points. There's, for me at the moment, uh, there's a particular documentary that I've been quite attracted to. Um, it's called, it's, it's from the collection from NEN here in Magalaya, and it's called When the Hens Begin to Crow. Uh, and it's really, um, when the hens crow, it's a documentary by Tarun Bhartya, and it's really about these three women in this particular village who were ostracized from the village because they kind of filed an RTI against the National Rural Employment uh, Guarantee Scheme, um, and how the village sort of ostracized them because they collected, you know, all the discrepancies, the corruption that was going on with sort of the scheme, um, and. Um, I'm really, uh, like for me, I feel like, and we also have like, you know, in the papers, this was written about it, this is way back in 2008. Um, and I wonder if now, if I look back to this material um, and I sort of retell or re or speak again about the lives of these women, like how would I do it? Would it spark something else? Because it talks a lot about the position of women in Meghalaya talking about the matrilineal structure that we have, but specifically about, you know, these three women who at that point of time, 2008, were, uh, you know, newspapers were writing about them and all that, but now we're into uh, 2022. Uh, how do I look back at this incident that had happened? Um, they were ostracized from the village, but at the same time, and then in the end, sort of, there was, they were brought back, they were accepted back, uh, into that space again. And um, um, so that's something that I've been very, you know, a lot, I've been thinking a lot about it and wondering how would I bring that forward? Uh, I mean, bring that sort of alive again um, and find its relevance in a way. Lots of different images, I think, have been coming in my mind or um, very much related to, you know, our community, very much related to our culture. So, yeah, <laughs> that's all I have to say. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, actually, for sharing about your uh, the earlier project you were talking about, sort of this idea of performing the photograph before and after. And I'd actually really love to follow it and look at it in some way. So maybe if you could share it, um, it would be great. And I also feel like Ariela Azulai's provocations around photography are particularly pertinent at this moment where we're talking about the circulation of images. So. What happened during the pandemic is that so many people were sharing family photographs and in a sense also there's this idea of like pride and family from you can say say uh even upper caste mainland indians let's use an example of their family and sort of the histories that they had but no one there's this just an old image or an image in the archive somehow in it on its own has this validated sort of exalted presence whereas not many people were asking you know who isn't allowed to enter the photograph who was probably right outside the photograph serving water yeah. to the people clicking the image you know um what's what yeah. are sort of the darker stories um that surround this image and i think that your work in a sense sounds like it could it addresses that that sort of um discomfort that at least a lot of us who work with archiving have been having with family photographs um or photographs such as uh these ones um 
so it would be really exciting to see that in terms of the uh, the project that you're talking about at the moment and looking at um, the collection of women from that time, I just wanted to understand what are the materials like through which you're accessing these histories? Are they, you said predominantly newspaper reports? Or... So uh, the what triggered this was a, a documentary that was mm -hmm. made. One is a documentary and uh, now I'm kind of going back to newspaper reports that I that I see online because I I don't remember in 2008 way back I I think I just left Shillong and I was not in Shillong as yet so I don't have a memory of it but I, there are newspaper sort of articles different articles um, I think it wasn't just in Meghalaya but I think Hindustan Times had covered it as well. Uh, I was reading some of it, but they would predominantly be newspaper articles mm. that had stemmed from this documentary that that I had discovered within the archives. Okay, that's. I mean, I think that. Uh, have you heard of Nepal Picture Library? Uh, that's based in. Oh, Kathmandu. sorry. Uh, Nepal Picture Library. No, no. Uh, actually, I think you might find them really interesting and their work uh, interesting. There is Citizens Archive that's based in Kathmandu, and they try to tell a recent history of Nepal sort of through um, by collecting citizens' archives. So, a lot of family photographs, materials from citizens' personal collections. And one of their priori priorities is to look at the public life of women, particularly those who were in politics. Uh, through mm -hmm. their personal collection, collection. So they wouldn't find a lot of materials, for example, officially, but they'd use newspaper re reports to sort of trace women and then they'd um, meet their family members and they'd see ephemera, like women's ephemera, their notebooks where they'd made maps. For example, some of them were part of the Marxist movement and were hiding out in the forest. So the maps they drew, but they also had like recipes and receipts of groceries, which somehow no other sort of um, at least male identifying figures kept this part of the archives. But when you also read the ephemera of, of these women in the public life or in public memory, it's it's very different. So I think that maybe um, they've had exhibitions, they've taken out publications, maybe their methods and processes might be a helpful reference. And I'd also be happy to look a bit more and send you something more um, around this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Nepal Picture Library, is it? Yes, I'll just, I'll just put it on chat okay. as well. Yeah. All right. I, I think uh, one of the questions I, I had uh, while I was, um, sorry, um, while I was looking uh, just a second. Yeah, um, I think because when I looked at the documentary, you know, it's already film. You know, it it's it already has uh, motion and movement, and you know, you see these people. And I'm, I think, where I'm finding sort of how as for me now as you know, using theater as a medium, uh, and I I have specialized in physical theaters. So I work a lot with the body. Uh, using the body, how, you know, how could I sort of draw out what the documentary, what the documentary has, and then how do I take it a step further with a live body, uh, with theater, with, I don't know. So I, I think at the moment I'm kind of uh, <laughs> wondering how to navigate like one medium uh, to another, to translate one medium into into another in a way. Yeah, that's something I don't know. Let's see. Uh, I just wanted to uh, to put in something regarding how, uh, like just, uh, just a bit of introduction, I think, not introduction, I would say, but the initial thoughts of how this project uh how this collaboration basically stemmed out of this project so i think like when we were devising the project we also had a, a conversation with samira you uh back in october i think or september when we were sort of just thinking about how to approach uh the how to approach these archives or uh, material from Nens work from the past uh, 27 years the project had come up in conversation back in March with uh, Ben Ba, with Monisha Bahel, who was the founder of uh, uh, who is the founder of Northeast Network, 
and she had recently retired uh, this year from her position. And uh, like for us, for me and Rishi specifically, when we had access to, to the physical archives, uh, so to say, and the digital stuff as well, it was simply so overwhelming, like so evidential of the kind of work that Northeast Network has been doing that it was uh, proving very difficult to have a point of uh, contention in, or, to, or just a point of arrival to approach these archives. And this is when uh, to create the sort of multidisciplinary approach or this collaborative approach made much more sense than individually translating or exchanging with the archives. And uh, I, I'm just saying it to connect uh, to uh, an observation that I made while uh, Samira and Nupo were presenting uh, about how uh, an archive, which is in essence uh, something so evidential and uh, something which is closer to documentary nature of things, is being interacted with and is being uh, translated or, or just exchanged by artists using tools which are highly conceptual in nature. So it is, it is a very interesting conversation that happens between the evidential nature of, an, of the archives and the conceptual nature of the artist. And something, sometimes these exchanges and how they go beyond just the evidential uh, information which is uh, being presented in the, in the archives and becomes a prompt for a much wider narrative that lies underneath in terms of social uh, or socio-political uh, aspects of the of the region which is contextual uh, to the archives and uh, yeah basically this was uh, this was just a train of thought that was running in my head and sort of uh, i uh, yeah tried to form words uh, within words uh, another thing that uh, Northeast Lightbox initially thought as Northeast Lightbox that we would do was to also not sort of uh, try to visualize Northeast Network's work because I think it is already much, much, much more impactful, visible, and just uh, uh, super diverse in the in the way that it uh, it has it has happened over the past two decades. But what we rather wanted to do was bring focus on the archive itself, like on the objective archive itself. And so we were thinking of using uh, tools of public interventions in terms of uh, uh, by using material from Northeast Network's posters or letters, photographs, uh, testimonials, or just excerpts from books to use all of this material uh, to have uh, and to draw from these materials to create uh, public interventions that would uh, lead to uh, the source of these archives. For example, something I don't know, like a poster in the in the public space with a QR code that leads directly to the archives. So basically, to democratize the access to the archives themselves, and not uh, yeah, and uh, apart from the conceptualization of the archives that is already happening within the residential residency group. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's what I wanted to say. Actually, thanks. That that really helps give a bit of um, bit of context in terms of opening up. So um, I think maybe I'm going to ask my colleague, and if everyone's fine, we can stay for a little bit longer um, because it'll be good to get hear also everyone. But I wanted to say that so the camp studio that I talked about, you know, these sort of pirates as they call themselves. So they often travel, they're very interested in seafaring histories, one of their works. So they travel to these limited exhibitions that happen with archives from often these sort of uh, big libraries in the United Kingdom. And they only lend out their archives and seafaring histories for two months and in some obscure Navy museums. So camp goes there and they click photographs of all the frames and their reflection is in the frame or, you know, the flash of the light is in the frame. So they're sort of playing around with copyright. Like we click these images. These are not scans that the library has sent us. And they have an annotated exhibition of the screenshots. I'll share it with you. But it's also like, I think what, what frees artists in a sense and what excites us that you don't have the commitment. I mean, not commitment. You don't have the obligations that a PhD candidate might have or a researcher scholarly one has. So you can also sort of deflect and go under or over sort of these these um, limitations or restrictions that we have to accessing archives and um, to the performing archive, I wanted to share another story of an artist who um, I shared an example of. 
So Afra, uh, like I showed, she was working with images of women in this uh, CSSC. And she saw this collection of women where they're sitting really kind of angry and pissed, staring at the camera. And these were photographs that were taken for their wedding matches. Okay, and they were supposed to be really beautifully dressed up and these would be circulated and then they find a match. But the thing is, it, she said that when I was reading the expressions of these images, it was so clear, firstly, that the women were defying it by looking really angry and unpleasant. Almost none of them were smiling. It's quite funny. And she said, she's like, I felt like they just wanted to be out of that image, you know, that they'd been forced in. So digitally, she created this thing where uh, often she doesn't actually show women with their faces. She sometimes creates these fictional characters, but she makes them fly out of the image to do something else. And she's like, I just wanted to use the digital to free these women of these images that they didn't seem to want to be in. So, um, I think honestly, Dr. you will be most equipped to show us what performance can do with the archive. Um, because I think you're so deep also in sort of that medium and that discipline. Um, and I look forward to following how, how you'll do it. I think honestly, you will be able to do more than us um, sharing with you. Uh, I should share it in chat. Afra Shafiq. I mean, uh, we have been discussing. <laughs> that was, I guess, Rishi's dad on the camera. That's exactly sorry, like my sorry. dad. That's exactly <laughs> sorry, like my dad. Yeah, actually, sorry. <laughs> I got a glimpse of Rishi's face. I have no time to. I have no time to. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to mention was. Uh, uh, so we have been like also uh, me and Kumam and uh, we have been in conversation trying to somehow uh, sort of contextualize these uh, not just practitioners but also the disciplines that come together and intertwine within uh, under the under the context of Northeast Network Archives and what would be the 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 way to or what would be an intellectual way to sort of connect all of these works to uh, to weave a narrative that goes just that goes beyond uh, the commonality of them being northeast network archives or being or being uh, annotations of the women's movement in the region within the northeast region so one uh, i mean of course we still don't have a concrete answer to that we still don't have like a uh, like a like a concrete uh, chain that connects all of the all of the works together but I think we are sort of navigating our way towards it. And uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe uh, as, if Aku is there, maybe he would also like to uh, mention what we had been talking about, his ideas of, uh, of uh, interacting with the, with the, with the NEN archives. And I think Aku also had a conversation with Kumam, no? About this. Uh... Are you talking to me, Devdeep? <laughs> yes, yes, sorry. I was just mentioning uh, ah, okay, okay. your way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks to Samira and Nupur for sharing, uh, you know, what you guys have been doing. And uh, it's wonderful. But uh, I also love uh, comments by uh, Labdiang because, uh, you know, the idea of archive and all this thing, you know, in, uh, in our indigenous society, you know, these are quite, uh, you know, uh, new. And I think, I mean, for me, I would say like, you know, our ancestors are like our archive, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and oral tradition plays a big role in archiving our history and past and memories. And, uh, and I believe in that also, because, uh, uh, you know, it's not, an organized and you don't need an uh, office or you don't need <laughs> a space uh, to uh, you know uh, keep this thing alive uh, but of course you know the new generation needs to document that and all and uh, in, and, and here comes uh, and there comes the importance of archive and apart from that uh, uh, for our this thing uh, I don't know uh, first of all I think I should introduce myself to Samira and Nupur. Uh, I'm from Imphal, uh, Manipur, and I'm a musician. 
So I've been talking to Devadeep uh, that, you know, what kind of thing I want to uh, create out of this residency and all this, uh, you know, brainstorming that we have been having. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know about other places, but women in the Northeast, uh, uh, they have been part of the conflict and they have been the victim. Uh, you know, uh, there's so many things uh, that I can share here, but I think to cut it short, but uh, to cut it short, I would want to say that, you know, uh, conflict is there and then uh, internally also there's like domestic violence and women have been the, at, the, at the receiving end. And I want to react on that in my uh, production. I don't know uh, what is I call it production or, but I'm hoping that I, I, I should be able to create a soundscape kind of a thing uh, at the end of this. And uh, I, I mean, there are many other things that I want to incorporate in this uh, soundscape. Like uh, if you guys remember the mother's protest in Manipur, you know, how they came up and uh, protested in front of the Assam Rifles uh, camp and, you know, and, and literally they threw away the Assam Rifles uh, from, from Kangla in Manipur, from the heart of Imphal. And that's a very significant protest to me. And I want to incorporate that all, uh, you know, it, it, it would be like a four minutes long soundscape, but uh, I think, you know, I, I, I may be able to incorporate that all in that soundscape. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, a Nordist uh, network archive would be helpful uh, to uh, you know, provide us the video for that. And I'm hoping to sit down with David and make a very powerful visual for that. I don't know if I'm uh, clear enough to you all. That's all what I wanted to say. Thank you, thank you. Aku. I mean, just to just to add to it, I think just a small thing that I would like to add because this was one of the major points between the discussion between me and Aku was that I mean, also in Northeast Networks uh, publications, we keep coming across this line a lot that uh, whenever they talk to people from the from from outside of the region there is this very common uh, narrative or rather not narrative just rather a pre-assumption like a social pre-assumption that uh, women in northeast they enjoy a higher status in society in a sort like a privileged status in in the northeastern society first of all so i think i mean the statement in itself is as convoluted as it can get, because what is a Northeastern society to start with? And uh, I think like the response that uh, Aku was looking for is also a direct contest to uh, statements like this, like generic statements like this, and also about matrilinearity in uh, Meghalaya, for example, or just misconceptions, which is associated with the, with the gender dialogue in the region. Uh, Sorry, another thing, just a small nudge. It's already uh, 7.30, uh, so maybe we can, I mean, uh, Samira, you tell me how long is it uh, comfortable for you? Uh, just give me one minute. I'm just going to ask my colleague. One second. Um, if it's okay with you all, uh, I could stay for 15 minutes if you don't like to stay or can stay. Nupur? Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, um, I think Kumam, you want to say something? Maybe then Nupur. And yeah, so it it is um it is in continuation to what Dave did kind of raise and what Aku also kind of spoke about, and so as a curator, you know, of this project, so I think I am driven by you know few um, concerns, you know, uh, concerns, and I think maybe it reflects like what Dave did. You said. So number one is clearly um, how does this exhibition, uh, you know, how does this exhibitioning of the archive kind of, uh, you know, uh, sort of embody an identity of its own, considering that it's going to be exhibited at the Assam State Museum, right? And the museum, whether it's Assam State Museum or another museum, has its own identity already, right? So how do we? 
how do I and how do the artists here and me kind of sort of bring up an identity of our you know exhibition itself in a space like a sound state museum so I think that's an ongoing thought you know um, that's number one number two uh, you know also we're talking about women archives you know uh, women's lives and archive right uh, so in that women how do I think this is also particularly uh, a point of let's say interest and issue from you know of me and Ritu Parna here as well uh, and maybe others as well but you know visibly Ritu Parna and me because we've worked together uh, with the uh, trans community trans queer community so how do we also kind of visibilize the trans women in the women archive and and in an archive uh, which may or may not have visibly kind of documented you know archive women a uh, trans women in the women uh, you know right as such so that's also another uh, concern element that i am kind of you know sort of thinking through you know throughout so how do we visibilize the invisible uh, in the you know women archive uh, number 3 is again from my point of view also we've seen the archive you know it's already digitized you know uh, by you know not just like box um, how do we also bring the subject of the archive the subjects of the archive like who are the women the women right the subjects of the archive again on the fore while also not while also sort of embodying the artists let's say aesthetics and style and politics and worldviews right so so a kind of archive uh, that does that does not sort of uh, silence the subjects you know so we want an archive which in which the subject speaks to us you know and i think that is i think my very particular you know or personal political standpoint there and how do i obviously speak to the rest of the art you know art practitioners along those lines and what do they think about uh, you know it's you know about it uh, number four i think again is something that david also mentioned uh, you know the whole idea of democratizing making it more accessible again from the subjects of the archive you know we're talking about women in often in rural settings you know or women which is who are outside of you know let's say social uh, financial privilege economic privilege so how does the archive make sense to them so i think this is a question uh, this is an this is a point which is i think sort of connected to the previous point that what kind of archive makes sense to them you know sense to them as well because it's their story it's their lives so these are few uh, thoughts that i've been sort of thinking through in the curatorial process david do you have something to respond to that uh, no i just missed the last part makes sense to them like uh, who them uh, the subjects of the archive the subjects of the uh, okay yeah yeah like the communities and the people within yes uh, yes okay. yes yes I can go next if there's time. Can you hear me? Please, yes, yes, please. Yeah. Um, so, um, so when I was going through the uh, so basic, uh, so I'll introduce myself first. I am currently a student at the National Institute of Design, um, photography design. So, um, uh, so in our dissertation, we have uh, we have to, ha. Huh? Not like it. So sorry. Uh, so for our dissertation, we had to look at um, archive and respond to it. And uh, since then, um, I have been thinking how, like, um, how the public archive stands against the personal archive, like the personal album, photo albums, etc. So. Um, um, so I was looking at the witch hunting cases in Assam, which, ha which happens in the remote villages in Assam. So, uh, so those um, cases are very gruesome and very like um, the the crimes, the the crime that happens and the details of it is very like uh, very serious and gruesome. So when these news reports are then um, reported in in the local newspapers, they have a certain style of reporting this news and the visuality of it or the language of it is very specific and uh, it is not at all empathetic for the you know so, so be it the survivors or be it the person we lost 
uh, who got hunted probably. And most of these um, survivors are women. So um, what I was thinking is that I was going through, so um, Nen has collected all these newspaper cuttings in a very elaborate manner. So they, they have also made these markings in, in the newspapers, uh, marking the places. And I was thinking if I could get inspired from, as in uh, if I could use these newspaper cuttings and then try to um, see that as the, uh, since that is a public archive and we don't have a control of it, right? The news is something that is uh, that will be reported and we do not have a uh, say or the survivors or the person who with whom the crime has happened do not really have a control over it so but then if i look at their own personal archives let's say their own family photo albums or their um, the photos that they have collected of themselves so the uh, the the contradictions of that i'm interested to look at the contradictions of both you know the public and the personal um, specifically uh, in the reportage of these, um, of the crimes against women, be it witch hunting or be it domestic violence or others. So, um, yeah, that's, that's something I've been thinking and I'll develop on it further. Yeah, if you guys have any um, comments on it, you can share. Nupur, do you have anything to say? Uh, I was just thinking about, I mean, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your thoughts and, and um, your ideas with, with us. Um, and it's, it's very interesting how you are all are kind of thinking about the complexities um, that that kind of archive uh, produces uh, for, for each one of you in, in different ways. And I think, um, I mean, one thing that I was thinking about, Pranami, uh, when you were uh, sharing your your kind of uh, uh, work on on witch hunting and the kind of archives that you are kind of looking at around that, I was thinking about one of the uh, kind of archival collections that we have called Om Swaha uh, and the Autonomous Women's Movement, which took place in the 1970s and 80s in India, uh, in different parts of India, where women uh, organization, but also independently women came together uh, to form these these autonomous groups uh, against dowry deaths uh, especially and, and sexual harassment and abuse that that women had to go through um and uh, i mean what we have in the in the archival collection that you see online is primarily shiba chachi's photo documentation uh, because she would kind of visit each and every uh, uh, performance of om swaha a kind of street play that was put together by these women um uh, but apart from that, there is also contextual material uh, which we gathered. Unfortunately, we're not able to uh, make it available online because these were different groups. There were also tensions, there were fallouts and different political positions with which they worked in the in the 70s and then they parted ways. Uh, but but what you see here is also, I mean, they were looking at, at that particular moment and they were also looking at newspaper uh, clippings, for example, as the evidentiary material. But they were also looking at the, the, their immediate neighborhoods where the actual cases were happening. They were collecting these stories. And then these stories would become part of this performance. And they had like hundreds of iterations and each iteration would become an improvisation with, with these stories, you know, that the stories that they were collecting through their conversations uh, with these women who actually had to kind of go through uh, uh, violence. Uh, so I was just thinking about like different forms. I mean, you, all of you are already kind of thinking about these different forms, whether it's oral history, uh, whether it's evidentiary material, whether it's state archive, whether it's personal archive. Uh, so, so I think these these multiple forms uh, kind of uh, is is an interesting site uh, to kind of think about. Uh, uh, but but I was also I mean especially for Pranami, I was thinking that have you kind of thought about or identified a form uh, uh, for for your work or how kind of are you thinking about it? Yeah, so uh, not very uh, clearly, but I have something in my mind like, um, so uh, for my, so I'm just going back to my dissertation because that's when I felt like the personal archive is so very important. 
um so whenever there is like uh, so if, so so let's say the muslim community you know so they, it is very specifically uh, represented in the popular media so the their whole identity is shaped in a certain way and that is that also remains with us so when i went through the archive of this uh, family the assamese muslim uh, family and it was so different than what i was fed like all the time from the popular media to like whatever cinema uh, advertisements and everything and and then i was um, then that is that that made me realize that that how people want to get represented is so different than how they get represented in, in the public uh, in the media so even uh, even while like uh, even while reporting so uh, the um, the the reportage of this news is so important but then uh, the kind of visuals that they use the kind of language that they use is not something that someone would want to uh, see themselves as in that public archive so i was thinking if i could use uh, methods of manipulation erasure and some sort of like intervention um on the physical material which is the print and try to subvert the idea uh, giving more agency to um to the uh, to the subject whose uh, news it is about or let's say to the family members or let's say if i do a um, a primary research reg re regarding that and try to gather more information on like how they feel about when you know their information is reported in this way so yeah so yeah so that's what i was thinking on, on that line yeah i think uh, for me this sounds quite exciting um because there's also this often this view of personal archives as somehow disorganized random fragmentary and people who come in have to organize it but in fact whether consciously or purposefully or not people's arcs, personal archives also reflect uh, a deep sense of how they want to narrativize themselves and those people do that work with personal archives have to be quite conscious to sort of attune to what narrative ones wants to tell i quickly give an example there's an iranian filmmaker uh and i can send you the name of a film she's made a film of her of her mother's life and um she talks about how there was this moment how so her mother moved to the west um to switzerland with her husband and over there she was forced to remove her hijab just to sort of fit into the community and there were many photos from her from that time but when she came back to tehran she sort of joined the islamic revolution and she put on her hijab back and she took all the family photos where she uh was without a hijab and chopped them and tore them and threw them away and she said that i want no memory of me without the hijab and this was a kind of purposeful gesture of her own so the archive that so what the daughter does in her she made a documentary film she takes these bits and pieces and she draws memories of her mother as a sort of um mythical figure almost but i'm just saying that there's a lot of these if we like really listen carefully there's a lot happening in person archives um where people are narrativizing themselves i know in my mother's archive i know she's put away all the bad photos of herself that's just a joke but i'm just saying that everyone is it would be interesting to spend time with materials and also maybe speculate on um what the person in that sense was trying to say but actually that brings me to this really important sort of point brought up by kumam and deepdeep that i really want to address which was about connecting to the subjects or the communities or individuals with which or who these archives are so the thing is i think at asia archive is it's a bit different because we actually work with copyright we're not working with copyleft so whoever's archives we digitize we actually do it in tandem with them or their family estate or whoever sort of has a control of that archive and um whenever we do an exhibition or someone uses it it's free to use but we need permissions from the person who we get it from um so in that sense that conversation with the archive and the person whose archive it is uh is constant it's complicated when it's a posthumous archive i have to say and we have a very long debate about this on the on our website if you'd like to look at it uh because it really complicates matter and one thing nupur and i have been doing recently is rather than reading writing written about people we just go into their writings and diaries and sketches and notes and see what they wrote like that's just our exercise of in a sense listening to them when we can't anymore but nepal picture library actually the example i gave they uh, they also get permissions from the women or their families or the subjects that they show 
they had very public exhibitions and i mean like in the main sort of temple squares etc and a lot of these women now much older gathered and they would just call their friends and be like oh my god look at myself oh my god look at you and then they said you know go to our friend here she has so many more albums and archives so i think that the location of where some people even did uh, one of the exhibitions happened at someone's house come home stay the archive of which they exhibited in the home state itself so that was one way the bit about speaking to the subject and how they are represented is um again depends on the effort and time that can be put in um to speak or listen to that individual and i think that, that that's possibly the best way to do it but being in the archive we know how long it takes um and how much effort there is um so i think that's my vague answer <laughs> to your question um yeah So Meera, could you uh, tell the name of the Iranian artist again? Sure. And... Let me just uh, let me sh just send you a link. Sure. Uh... Anything else? Um, I know they've, they've asked about making connections, uh, which is a tough question. <laughs> Nupur, I don't know, as researcher, if you have anything to say to that, but yeah. Also, another, just a small, small question that I would also like to follow up. Uh, it's not a question, it's more of an observation of uh, uh, the association of uh, fictionalization along with archives, which is again, like comes into the, the conceptual boundaries of things, of, of thought processes. But then I, I noticed this such a romantic association that there lies between uh, fictionalization of archives, of evidential uh, information, mm. and the kind of uh, uh, landscapes that they can expose us to. Mm. So also while Pranami was saying uh, it was, this was what I was also connecting to my head about uh, manipulation of uh, archival evidence to suggest towards uh, social cultural landscapes or so uh, or yeah objective uh, documentary making or documentary information of uh, like how manipulation of evidence can actually point towards uh, towards more uh, detailed nuances of micro histories or uh, histories which are not being documented uh, in the way that uh, yeah or uh, which are just being manipulated uh, uh, documented in a in a not so sensitive manner or a not so mm. uh, empathetic manner yeah i mean i mean the other side of this is to be we were just discussing this off in office today for example seeing the shiv statue was under the babri masjid i mean if you look at sort of the right wing hindutva agenda in india that's also speculative fiction in a sense so i think that um one of the one of the ways to really that i mean it's it's a concern it's not an answer is to also really like look at the agenda of what is being speculated and how it's been speculated and why it's being fictionalized i mean i mean aku has left but his point about music and i mean what he was talking about sound and the fact that the ancestor stories or um, they don't have archives that is the archive the infrastructure of the archive is not a co concrete building but a story and Archives have to bend themselves, I think, and we have to create uh, 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 infrastructures to sort of hold these stories and listen to them. But that agenda is very different from um, the agenda of speculating, in a sense, what was under a mosque a long time ago. And then that becomes a question of the discipline of history and archaeology um, itself. So I think. To to think about the fictional and speculative would be very much on sort of the intention and location 
um, of who is speculating, which is also in the way in which I think exhibitions or we at least present artists and um, their work, even in presentation, is like to deeply also situate them. <laughs> That's where you're coming from. Um, when they're speculating or fabulating, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to share one example. Like um, this is one of our grantees, Sharmishtha Saha. Uh, she received the Inlax Asia Archive grant a couple of years back. Uh, and she's a theater practitioner uh, based in Bombay and a researcher. And her research is primarily uh, on 19th and early 20th century archives, theater archives, uh, where she's looked at state archives primarily uh, uh, in Bengali. But also her the project that she received the grant for was also looking at archival material in Marathi as well as in Bengali. And she looked at contracts. She looked at like because in 19th century, these theater companies would have contracts signed with the with the artist. Uh, she also looked at police records uh, in, in Bengal, uh, especially related to theater practices, censorship, uh, which happened in the colonial period. And I think, I mean, I mean, she what she did was she kind of uh, used this material in, in a, I mean, evidentiary material, but to kind of speculate certain, uh, you know, narratives about a position of, of women, about labor practices, about exploitation, about censorship, uh, and so on and so forth. And which kind of then was developed into a, a full fledged performance, like a theater performance. Uh, and then she used device theater as, as a tool. Uh, so she uh, gathered these materials and these, these archival materials were shared with the uh, actors. And then the actors kind of speculated on these materials. They, they did workshops and it kind of developed into a, uh, into a full fledged performance. So I think there is, I mean, like Samira was saying, it is also the location from where you are positioning uh, yourself. And also I think kind of, you know, uh, finding these, these, this in between ground, uh, between evidentiary and kind of fictional speculative to kind of build uh, uh, alternative narratives about history. Thank you so much, uh, Nupur. Because, uh... I was just thinking though, just this, this very interesting position that lies between fabrication and uh, reality and how the entire, also what from uh, with, uh, what Samira had mentioned about the state's role in <clears throat> constructing these uh, realities from history to sort of uh, contextualize or uh, create favorable uh, narratives for current political landscapes. So, I think it also uh, makes a lot of sense about uh, about about artists' positions or people's positions when they when they come and uh, interact with these archives, sort of to uh, to create narratives that uh, might not entirely be real, but then they do present a better uh, illustration of the reality that might have been rather than documented or reported reality. Uh, I just saw that it's it's getting closer to eight eight p.m. now, and uh, lots of uh, lots of chains of thoughts that I've been just trying to note down in my in my uh, in my notebook, and uh, I think it's it's been quite interesting where uh, where all of these uh, all of these notes have been leading to because I mean what essentially happened today was like I just wrote down like sort of mediums ideas context against everyone's name and. It just provided like a such a uh, I don't know illustrated uh, uh, umbrella of the whole context that all the practitioners, specifically in this in this archival residency, have been working with. So that has been something really positive out of this session. And uh, yeah, I think I will be sharing uh, pictures of these notes if if someone uh, I mean in the in the group. But uh, I I really hope that you can uh, that it makes sense in some ways. But yeah. Yes, please. This has been a really wonderful session. And like, you know, I think, you know, it being the 10th session, it kind of has really, you know, I think through all these other sessions, we've been finding links and connecting points or a thread. And somehow today, it feels very much like sort of a connecting link and to re to also understand, you know, where each of us are coming from as practitioners and just to voice uh, these ideas. Um, 
And yeah, that has been really, and thank you so much, uh, Samira and Nipur. It's, it's really been so nice just to be able to have this conversation with you and listen to, uh, to you both. Very, very helpful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, thank you, especially for all your provocations and questions that I have noted and questions that really we don't have an answer to. Um, but it's nice to like sort of keep talking. Um, and uh, I really wish I could see your exhibition. Hopefully we'll get to see the documentation of it. And um, we're here in Delhi. If you ever visit or pass by, so please stay in touch. And also, um, if you want to discuss anything anytime over a phone call or uh, deep, deep over Google Meet, Rishikesh, may be, I, we'd be happy to kind of speak more if you need, or you can always email us um, directly. Um, Instagram DM, <laughs> you can, we're here to sort of chat um, more. So yeah, thank you, Nupur. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. And yeah, best wishes for your exhibition and hope to see uh, you all in person sometime soon. Uh, and yeah, so I'm looking forward to the documentation of the exhibition, actually, <laughs> the actual exhibition. The evidence. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, we have been we have been toying with the idea of also to to make it like a sort of like a traveling exhibition, not literally, but maybe conceptually or intellectually that it might. Mm. It, I mean, ideally, we would want uh, it to travel through the region, through the through the places that the practitioners come from, mm. and sort of have I don't know, like a series of events that uh, mm. trace themselves back to this first uh, exchange with the archives that uh, that has been happening over the past two months. And but yeah, again, all of these are just conceptual plans in the head. And uh, I think the first uh, the the floodgates will open on May eighth with the opening of the exhibition, <laughs> and then we see where this all leads to. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, bye. 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 <laughs> bye. Have a nice bye. evening. Bye. Good you night. too. Bye. <laughs> see you. See you.